Before uh, Winnipeg's game against the Seattle Kraken on Tuesday, did you know that the Jets had not played a single game to a shootout until that evening? Well, the Jets not only had their first shootout, they had their first shootout victory of the season in a game in which Winnipeg was actually pretty impressive. A few blemishes on the night, but overall, a very strong effort and a great performance against a team that, quite honestly, looks like a legitimate playoff squad. We'll dive into this game and how the Jets handled the Seattle Kraken on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. Or Locked On the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode, but most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Make every moment more by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Now, like I said at the uh, top of the episode, the Jets played their very first shootout of the season. Can you believe that? Uh, it's been apparently, you know, what, like 53 games and somehow the Jets haven't actually had a shootout, which I didn't even realize I'd You know, it feels like just yesterday we were kind of kicking off the season and now we're almost to the end. Less than 30-ish games to go, just about. Winnipeg is really looking at the home stretch. And, you know, for the most part, the Jets are in a pretty good spot as far as, like, playoff security is concerned. But let's be honest, the Jets also can't really rest on their laurels. And the last thing Winnipeg wants to do is start to slide in the standings, make it harder, you know, make it harder for itself once uh, the wild cards start to fill in and end up in a seed that's not super favorable. So for the Jets, it really behooves them to take all of the points that they can get. And after a win against the Hawks over the weekend, Tuesday presented a bit of a different challenge with the Seattle Kraken. Now, the Kraken have lost something like four of their five last games heading into this one. So you could say that Seattle was on a bit of a poor run of form, but the Kraken this year have played the Jets very closely uh, Winnipeg had actually split the season series up until this point, and we all knew Seattle's a legit team, right? Last year, not so great. This year, a genuine force and one for the Jets to have to watch out for because there's a decent chance that if Seattle does advance out of the Pacific Division and say Winnipeg makes it to the conference finals, Seattle might very well be an opponent the Jets face, which makes this matchup kind of interesting, right? A, a bit of a playoff preview of sorts should all of these things pan out. Obviously, we are a very long way away from that, but the time will kind of creep up a lot faster than you think. And if the Jets are to face this Kraken team in the postseason, this was a very interesting first uh, impression of how the Jets are right now versus a Kraken team that, you know, for, for all of the quality that it has, definitely has some vulnerabilities in terms of like elite scoring depth. And in this game, you know, the Jets generally controlled play for most of the evening. The first two periods, the Jets massively outchanced and outshot the Kraken. Seattle had a lot of trouble doing zone exits. Their defensive structure looked very static. Uh, I thought Winnipeg really dominated puck cycles. Winnipeg got into the low slot area. And the only reason that it took a while for anyone to even score in the first place was that, you know, uh, Philip Grubauer was really putting on a clinic. David Riddick really didn't have that much work to do for much of the game, but um, you know, a, a few early chances. I thought he did some some pretty nice saves, but for the most part, it was the Grubauer show. I thought Phil was phenomenal. This is probably one of his best games in some time. So you know, naturally, it would come against the Jets, right? Winnipeg, even when they have like all of the finishing talent in the world, always seems to run into like one random hot goalie for an evening. That you know, despite dominating the opponents, the Jets end up you know, usually on the losing end of the ledger. Thankfully, that didn't happen in this game. 
But Winnipeg did have a couple of scares and there were some interesting decisions from Bones that I want to dive into later just because I feel like um, we're seeing some trends from him recently where I'm starting to wonder if if maybe Bones is getting into a few too many bad habits for my liking. But as far as this game is concerned, the only period that was bad for the Jets was probably the third. Uh, other than that, though, Winnipeg generally took advantage of some, some poor uh, defensive coverages. Blake Wheeler had a great goal off of a forced turnover from Ehlers uh, from behind the net. And then uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois ended up tying the game later, forcing overtime, and then, you know, ended up scoring the shootout winner to give the Jets both points. But you might notice I said tied because Seattle did score twice. And uh, some of the goals were kind of like, you know, the first one was was a, a good tap. And I'll say there was a blown coverage and John Hayden got on the inside. Uh, Geeky ended up feeding him a perfect pass on the doorstep and Hayden wasn't going to miss. But the McCann goal just sort of pinballed off of somebody on the power play. I think you could say Dubois was probably at fault because he took a bit of a silly penalty uh, body checking. I don't know if it was Vince Dunn or somebody else. And it was away from the plate. Very obvious right in front of the linesman. Really can't say that Dubois had an argument against it. It was a clear penalty and the Jets ended up uh, paying the price. So tonight was very much, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde routine from uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois. But thankfully, he ended up, you know, coming good when it mattered most. And Dubois, you know, called game, won it for the Jets and that's just what you like to see with the Jets chasing the Dallas Stars uh, for first in the central. You know, Dallas also ended up having only a, a single point out of this evening, which was really important. Uh, Boston, thank you for winning, even though it wasn't in regulation, still does count in the end. And I think the Jets will certainly take that as they are trying to uh, secure any route towards that first place finish. You know, more time at home and certainly some rest in the opening uh, proceedings of the playoffs would be really great for the Jets. And even if they only stay in the second seed, right, Winnipeg is still sitting pretty. And with the trade deadline looming, the Jets might get even better. But I did mention that there were some blemishes on this evening that I think are probably worth spotlighting just because some of these things are becoming an increasing trend with the coaching staff. And I can't say that I am not at least a little bit concerned about some of the decisions. We'll dive into those in just a moment. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, and that is bonus bets if your uh, first bet doesn't win. A really nice safety net for you if you are the kind of person who is trying to dip your feet in but is maybe concerned about it. But, you know, all you have to do is just download the FanDuel app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use and very quick to get set up. And then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scorers to the number of threes drained. So a lot of you are probably watching uh, the, the Celtics this year, once again, a powerhouse, but maybe you think the Golden State Warriors are going to still have a high flying offense. Maybe you're tracking the Lakers. Uh, maybe you're continuing to watch LeBron's legacy unfold. Whatever you want to cast your bets on, it is safe and easy and super quick. And best of all, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. Don't miss this chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I mentioned earlier as we were talking about Winnipeg versus Seattle, you know, I was kind of going over the good points, right? Uh, the Jets winning 3-2, to two, big shootout victory, first shootout victory of the year. Pierre-Luc Dubois having a bit of a bounce-back performance after a rough game. But I also said that there were some blemishes, particularly on the coaching side of things. And some of these things have kind of been ongoing issues for a while now. I, I think the last month or two have really um, put more of a spotlight and an emphasis on the stuff that I think Bones occasionally struggles with. One thing that I've noticed with him is that he definitely has a, a number of skaters that he feels are like his defensive shutdown guys. And those players, to be honest, I, I, I think they do forecheck well, but I don't know about defensive stability. I've kind of talked about, you know, Sakuman uh Carson Kuhlman, you know, some of these players who I think look like really good defensive experts and maybe even in some areas do provide defensive value, but overall what they're doing on the ice and what they're bringing 
it's not enough. I think Manalainen's play in this game in particular was a really good illustration of what I'm talking about, right? He would get into the offensive zone. He would make zone carries. And, you know, after he got in, suddenly the possession is lost. He'd occasionally just turn over the puck blindly, making a, a drop pass to no one. It gets picked off, taken the other way, and very nearly gets punished for a goal against, were it not for some really good blocks and some big saves from David Riddick. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of an uneven performance there. And sometimes when the Jets are struggling to score, you'll see Bones throw this line blender together. And Manalainen, you know, was one of the guys who got promoted. At one point, he was in the top six. And then we also saw Perfetti on the fourth line for a little bit after Perfetti had already had a pretty good evening for a player who uh, unfortunately wasn't really able to crack the score sheet, but was generally one of Winnipeg's most dangerous attackers and very creative. And I, I just, I didn't really understand why you would demote Perfetti over some of the other um, grindery kind of players, right? I, I get if you want to uh, maybe take some of the pressure off the rookie or whatever, but overall Perfetti has, has generally handled the pressure really well. And I think benching him doesn't really send the kind of message that I would necessarily think is, is what you want to emphasize. So I think Bones really needs to look more at the sorts of players that he's putting out there, especially when you have to defend a lead. A lot of the guys that he trusts don't actually do it that well. The other thing that continues to be a real uh, headache for the Jets is the power play. I know that the power play, um, I think the finishing rate this year isn't bad, but when you look at their puck movement and you look at the occasionally static nature of that special teams unit, you have to ask yourself why this power play isn't better. The Jets have so many good weapons that they can load up all in one unit, but we see Ehlers not even playing uh, on the first power play unit in this game and certainly trailing in, in 5v5 time as well. You see um, 2D on the power play at times. You you know you saw Pionk and Schmidt deployed together during some occasions where the second unit was out there. So, you know, it's not super shocking to me that the power play isn't really doing well when I see stuff like this. Ehlers on that top unit immediately changes the, the dynamic, but I know that they also want Wheeler on that first unit instead of Ehlers. So I, I do get it to an extent. I think Wheeler um, in this game actually had a couple of really good chances. He scored on one of them and he almost scored on another. But generally speaking, Ehlers for that first power play unit just makes a lot more sense. And then kind of going off of that, you know, I said his even strength time wasn't great. And then we got to overtime and Ehlers basically didn't play at all. Uh, Wheeler actually had more ice time than Ehlers did in OT, which, you know, for a player who is on the wrong side of 30 and generally takes a bit to get up to speed, why would you use Wheeler over Ehlers in uh, a, a version of hockey where there's so much more space and it's all about fast and rapid counterattacks? So a lot of confusing elements to this game, despite the scoreline being in Winnipeg's favor. It's really funny because I'm finding nit, you know things to nitpick with the Jets after a, a generally dominant victory, but some of these things we've seen uh, in past games where the Jets lost as well, and in some other victories where maybe the margin was a little bit closer and maybe Winnipeg wasn't playing as well. So yeah, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that Bones is a bad coach. I don't think that's really the case, but I do understand some of his idiosyncrasies. And when you think about it, some of them aren't that dissimilar from Paul Maurice and some of the other assistant coaching staff. But on the whole, you know, still pretty positive about Bones, still a fan of his. I think he's generally still doing a pretty good job. So at the end of the day, this is kind of me honing in on some things that I think aren't great decisions and so far haven't bit the Jets. But, you know, come playoff time, let's try to avoid that and let's have a different mindset when, you know, the chips are all on the table and the Jets are cashing them in for that last second, last gasp winner. Now, obviously the Jets have uh, some not so easy opponents coming up over the next few days. Winnipeg has a big road trip ahead through the Metro division. And let's be real, the Metro uh, this year is is really freaking difficult to get through. We're going to dive into who Winnipeg's next opponents are and how many points the Jets might come away with in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at Built.com. If you've heard me talk about Built Bars, you know that I'm personally a very big fan. Built, you know, really tried to develop a product that tastes great and allows you to enjoy a candy bar without the actual candy bar guilt. And that's why, you know, Built Bars are, are basically the only protein bar that I really stand by. They are packed with flavor, coated in 100% real chocolate, 
and they've got a soft, chewy interior. And best of all, they come in fantastic flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. One of my personal recommendations is raspberry dark chocolate. Very basic, very simple, but very tasty and well executed. So, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, you said it's guilt free, right? How good could it could it be for you? And Bill Bars clock in at around, I don't know, 130 calories, uh, four to five grams of net carbs and around 17 grams of protein. So whether you're looking for something before you head out for a workout, maybe a snack in the afternoon or maybe even some kind of a breakfast supplement. Built Bars are there for you, and you can pick them up at Sam's Club or at Walmart in four packs and 13 packs that contain some of their most popular flavors, or as always, head to Built.com to customize your order and find your pers- a personal perfect flavor uh, for Built Bar. I promise you, you will not regret it. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked on Jets. We're just wrapping up real quickly with some final thoughts on Winnipeg's upcoming schedule of games. It's not going to be easy. The Jets have a, uh, a big swing through the, uh, through the Metro division, which, you know, is kind of like the central of the East, except this division is even stronger. It has so many teams who are, are either really good or kind of in the so-called mid-pack, but would actually be in the upper echelons of the Western Conference. Up first, though, the Jets have a nice, easy, soft introduction uh, against the Columbus Blue Jackets. This is a game the Jets really should be winning. Columbus is a terrible, terrible team, arguably one of the worst in the league and would be the worst if the Anaheim Ducks didn't exist. But, you know, for the Jackets fans, I'm sure they're probably relieved that uh, the Ducks exist because, you know, Anaheim is just almost unwatchable. Although maybe for the Bedard odds, the Jackets would prefer uh, a worse seed. But overall, you know, I think this should be an easy two points. Every time I say that, though, we usually find the Jets struggling to win. So maybe I shouldn't say anything, especially because the next game is where you start to see some really, really tough opponents. Winnipeg is going to be facing the New Jersey Devils on Sunday, which should be a marquee matchup and also a fascinating uh, like storyline game because both the Jets and the Devils have been linked to Timo Meyer. It seems like Meyer is more heavily linked to the Devils right now, but we all know that the Jets are really hard after Timo. I know that the fan base and myself have basically been memeing it up to this point. We've, you know, demanded that the Jets sign him uh long term, bring him in on a big trade package. We all want Turbo Timo Meyer on this team and so do the Devils. So very interesting game. Two of the top teams in the league Let's hope the Jets can at least come away with a point. I think it's going to be really difficult to expect that, though. After that, the Jets uh, have a second half of their back-to-back from the weekend, taking on the Rangers. Uh, This one's going to be a really tough one. I think the Rangers are a very solid team, and while the Jets may have defeated them before, you really don't want to bank on that on uh, New York's home turf. So, tough game. I think the Jets have a chance at a point, but it will be very hard fought. After that, the Jets face the Islanders, the other New York team, and the Isles are a squad that I think the Jets can certainly take on and handle. Uh, Bo Horvat, though, has kind of reignited their offense, so not a team that I think you can take lightly, and it's going to be, I guess, a bit of a fun teaser before the Jets face the Colorado Avalanche on the weekend, and then the Islanders again uh, on that Sunday. So, Yeah, I think out of these six games, I would be very surprised if the Jets came away with like six points. I think this is going to be a really, really tough slate of games. And, you know, if the Jets only win half of them or get points in half of them, I don't think we should be too, too upset just because the opponents that they're facing on the road are very tough. We all know the Metro division is a, a bit of a meat grinder, but you know what? In order to be the best, you still have to find a way to beat the best. And I think the Jets have generally answered the bell when it comes to teams that are uh, considerably ranked higher than Winnipeg is. And it would be nice if the Jets could kind of stick it to New Jersey and at least make a statement game there, even if it doesn't end in a victory. But let me know your predictions for this weekend and the upcoming weeks of games. Let me know if you think the Jets are going to win their next six or maybe you think that they're going to split them down the middle. Drop your thoughts in the YouTube comments below and at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. As always, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. But for tonight's episode, that's going to be all the time that we have. Thanks for listening. Have a great night and go Jets go.